Hey, good morning, everyone. So um, I hope you, you're all enjoying your time here in uh, Berlin. This is my first time at MicroExchange, but uh, this is a really cool conference, and I hope to come back next year. So um, I'm super excited to tell you about some of the innovations that we're working on for the serverless world. Uh, my name is George, and I'm one of the specialist solutions architects at AWS, and I focus on uh, the serverless platform. So I help our customers uh, build applications running on Lambda, API Gateway, Cognito, DynamoDB, and the, and the other serverless uh, services. So I'm based out of the Washington, D.C. area. So um, has anybody traveled into Berlin? Anybody from other countries, other cities? Or is everybody local? Cool. So we've got like a third of uh, the people that, that traveled in. Um, in my past life, I was a software engineer, so I spent a lot of time doing uh, Java development, open source uh, type activities. So um, on the bottom here is all my contact information. So at the end of the talk, if you have any questions or if you're using any AWS services, pl please feel free to reach out to me, email, Twitter. Uh, we also have a Slack channel where a lot of uh, developers worldwide are working on applications, and you can sort of uh, collaborate that way. So um, why don't we get started? So, I think everybody here, uh, being a microservice conference, understands this transformation that the industry went through um, in the last few years. So it actually started a long time ago, but you know, as a Java developer back in the mid-2000s, I used to build these really large ear files and war files, and then I'd deploy them to like, these really heavy app servers. So IBM WebSphere, uh, you know, JBoss, and even Tomcat, right? Has anybody experienced that before? Like, is that yeah, so that like everybody understands the pain, right? So um, how do you scale those types of applications? You really only have one choice. You add more servers and you deploy the same package or the binary file across all of these servers and you just get more and more servers. So you know, we started moving away from that because it was hard to innovate and it took a long time to deliver those types of applications. So. Um, Okay, so uh, we all understand, right? Monoliths are typically built in the same technology stack, and they're typically implemented with everything in one package. So a few years ago, the industry invented a term called MVC. Anybody know what MVC is? The model view controller. So like in the Java world, we have struts or JPA and, and Hibernate to build all these layers, and all of these layers are implemented in the same technology stack. And um, it didn't matter if your use case was suited for those tasks. You just had to implement it in the same technology. So in the Java example, it would all be you know, Java-based technologies. With microservices, you can now implement your applications using completely different technologies. And it doesn't matter that one microservice is built in Ruby and another one is built in, in Node.js. They just have to be able to communicate using a standard protocol. So. Um, over the course of these last few years, you know, we learned, we try to answer this question as industry. So what do businesses and what do developers really want? So we learned that businesses just want to move faster. They don't care how you do it, right? As an engineering team, your business leads and your, and your, your directors want you to move faster, innovate quicker, and deliver your applications better than others. So as developers, we want to focus on innovation. However, we don't want to deal with all that heavy lifting of infrastructure and applications and networking and all that stuff. We just want to write our application code so that we can deploy them and, and make our applications unique. So when I was an app developer, I always had to tell uh, my data center team, you know, how many CPUs do I need? How many cores do I need? What kind of IOPS? And as an app developer, I had no idea. I basically just gave them random numbers. And, and it, like, if it didn't work, um, you know, we'd go and change it. Right? And, and that pain became easier as we moved into the cloud. Uh, but as an app developer, I'm not a hardware guy, and, and I had to learn some of that just because you have to deploy to, to, to infrastructure. So um, AWS built the serverless platform over the last few years. And uh, before we even did this, it was basically just event-driven computing. And we built this platform to help us and help the industry overcome some of these, these challenges. So, we built it really for four main reasons, and these are like our four main tenets of why serverless exists. Um, I'd love to talk to you after the talk to, to hear what some of your main reasons for going serverless are, um, 
But number one, never any infrastructure. So when you use the platform, serverless is meant to be code first and never have, you never have to manage networking, IP addresses, all of those all details about uh, like an on-premise deployment. Number two, scaling should be built in and inherent to the architecture, which means as an app developer, I just need to build my code to make it efficient. If my code gets more executions, AWS will handle execution and scale you out on, on your behalf. Uh, the third piece here is, is pay for value. And I like to say pay for value because every request that you deliver is going to be directly correlated to the cost of your business delivering to your customers. So you no longer have to pay for idle instances. And when you have idle instances, those are kind of tough to correlate your costs to delivering business value. So let's say you have 10,000 executions on Lambda. All 10,000 of those now can be co directly correlated to delivering some kind of business value to your customer. Um, and then obviously, if you're using the, the platform, you inherit everything that AWS has. All the security features, uh, all the DDoS protections, all the scaling, and all the best practices that we've built in our own services. So, um, serverless is basically an evolution of the cloud operational model that you're already using today. So uh, AWS offers in three different areas uh, services that you can use to build your applications. Um, with compute, it's typically in the serverless platform, you can build applications as code using Lambda, or if you're building containers, you can use serverless containers using Fargate. Um, and then we also have multiple different types of data stores that can help you store data. So S3 for object store, DynamoDB for uh, NoSQL uh, database needs. And there's a whole bunch of other services that help you do application integration. So API Gateway helps you build REST and WebSocket APIs, all the way out to AppSync that helps you build uh, GraphQL APIs. So um, as we're building our next generation serverless applications, they look more and more like this. Right? So we have a whole bunch of microservices, and they all expose APIs so that we can integrate with them. And these APIs typically are REST-based, so that they're over HTTP, and, it, and it, the purpose is so that we abstract away all of the hard details and, and, and the core details of what our microservice is doing. That way application developers and teams can completely separate each other from, the, from their workloads. So we heard in a lot of the other talks today and yesterday that app developers really want to be able to deploy without impacting or waiting for other teams. And that's, that's one of the number one goals in, in going to a microservice architecture. So um, when I'm talking to customers, they all ask me this usually, is now that we're moving to a serverless microservice-based architecture, isn't it really hard to, to manage all of these little services? Back when I was doing monolith deployments, we had one service, and that was we deploy the service, it's had everything in it, we scale it, and then we're done. But now that we have all these services, how do we manage all that? So um, has anybody heard of the AWS shared responsibility model? Does that sound familiar? A couple people? Cool. So effectively what it means is that when you're on the cloud, AWS will handle some of the responsibility of the system, and you as a customer will handle the rest. And that line can shift depending on the services that you use. So let's take an example of the, of the first line under the compute line. So let's say you deploy an application on-premise. When you're on-premise, you have to manage everything from the hardware to the network to the infrastructure all the way up to the OS and then the software on the OS. As you move over into EC2 onto AWS, Amazon handles most of those hardware infrastructure details and you manage from the OS and up. So that's, that's where the shared responsibility begins. Now as you keep moving over to the right, and go all the way to the right on AWS Lambda, AWS handles all of the undifferentiated heavy lifting, and the first step that you do as an app developer is write code. So the line shifts depending on what, what you're doing, and in serverless, uh, as a developer, all you have to do is, is talk about code. So there's a whole bunch of other categories on this list. You know, we won't go through every single one of them. Just be aware that every one of these offers a shared responsibility model. So um, let's focus on compute for now. So let's talk about Lambda. Has anybody written a Lambda function before? Great, it's like most people. Cool. So Lambda is essentially a serverless event-driven application compute platform. 
So you write application code, and we execute it for you on your behalf. Uh, what's really cool about it is that um, the programming model is really simple. It's just based off of the idea that you as an app developer can programmatically invoke a Lambda function through the SDK or CLI, or you can have Lambda automatically trigger based off of an event that gets emitted from the AWS ecosystem. So some of those events uh, could be a change in a data state. For example, you might have a DynamoDB table that you insert records to, or delete records, or update records. Those events can be emitted to a stream and automatically pushed to Lambda, and the Lambda will react to those streams. So if you're familiar with a relational database and you're writing triggers to manipulate um, records as they come in, this is very similar. Another thing is, uh, another example is, is a request made to an endpoint. So let's say you have a REST endpoint and you're building a microservice and you need to have some kind of compute behind that. So you deploy the REST endpoint using API Gateway and it can automatically invoke a Lambda function and then perform those heavy compute tasks. Last example here is a, a change in a resource state. So um, who's familiar with S3, Amazon S3? Cool. So S3 is an object store. You can put as much information as you want binary objects, and uh, when you put information or object in S3, typically you want to react to that, that, that store, right? So an example is maybe you're, you're on an application with your mobile phone, you take a picture, and it gets stored in S3. And a lot of our social media companies today need to, first thing they have to do is take that picture and resize it so that it can be displayed on all different devices of different sizes, you know, computers, huge television screens, little mobile phones, tablets. You wouldn't want to push the same resolution photo to every single device, because it's a waste of bandwidth, number one, and it's also a waste of compute, and it gets really expensive. So on upload, you can have S3 emit an event and automatically trigger a Lambda function to perform the image thumbnail resizing. So instead of having a fleet of VC2 servers waiting for that work to be there, you just have Lambda triggered as events come in. And we scale on your behalf. So if you have a million users, it automatically scales. Overnight, if you have no users, there's nothing that exists, and you don't get charged anything. So functions can be written in seven different programming languages today, um, and multiple different versions of each programming language. So for example, Node supports Node 6, Node 8, um, Python 2, and Python 3, a um, bunch of other languages as well. Uh, my favorite is uh, typically you know, one of the, the lighter um, programming languages like Node and Python, uh, but we do support Java, C Sharp Go, and also recently Ruby. So at a high, very high level overview, this is kind of how Lambda works. The only thing you have to do as an app developer is select the memory configuration that the Lambda function needs. And that can range from 128 megs all the way up to three gigabytes. So when you do that, we give you a proportional allocation of CPU and network throughput power. So behind the scenes, if you need more power, more CPU, just allocated more memory. So um, Lambda functions can run for up to 15 minutes. So uh, depending on your workload, you can configure the timeout on how long you want your function to run for. And the, price, the pricing model for Lambda is pretty straightforward. It's just based off of two, uh, two pieces of detail. One is the number of invocations you give Lambda, and two is how long your function ran for. And the AWS free tier gives you one million free invokes every single month, and that doesn't expire. So you can go and test Lambda and run Lambda pretty much for free in all of your development environments. Um, so uh, this is kind of the anatomy of a Lambda function. Every Lambda function has what we call a handler method, and a handler method is, a, is essentially where execution begins for your application. So if you're familiar with Java, this is like your main method. But you have to tell Lambda where to begin execution. And in this case, it's a, it's a method called handle request. And my method always takes two parameters. The first parameter is the metadata around what event triggered Lambda. So in this case, I'm triggering Lambda because I'm checking out of a hotel. And I need to tell this checkout event all the details about my checkout. You know, who I am, my credit card, um, all the different things that need to, be, need to be built. And this event object is simply just a Java POJO, just a plain old Java object. It just has getters and setters on it. Um, it can be easily serialized and deserialized into JSON. And the context parameter, with the second parameter there, 
is a parameter that's generated by AWS. So you don't have to generate this one. This is going to be generated by AWS and automatically injected into your handler. And what that's going to give you is a bunch of metadata around why your function was invoked. So who invoked it, the permissions around the, the user, the IP address that it came from, what service invoked your function, all that metadata. So you can call the context parameter to get those details and determine why your function was invoked, where it came from, and maybe perform some logging. So um, when you're ready to expose your Lambda functions to your microservices, you can use Amazon API Gateway to do that. An API Gateway has the ability to seamlessly integrate and accept REST-based requests from the internet or from your private VPC, and then inject and invoke any of your backends. So those backends can be Lambda functions, can be other HTTP services running in your VPC, um, or really could be any other publicly accessible endpoint. So um, REST is really suitable uh, for most of our, our use cases today. Uh, but what if you're building real-time applications that are super chatty, that are very network heavy, right? So uh, very recently, uh, we announced and added the ability to build WebSocket APIs directly in API Gateway. So now you can create those real-time chats, those dashboards, and API Gateway will manage all of the persistent connections from your clients. So when clients connect to API Gateway WebSockets, we'll manage all of that for you. So instead of standing up, standing up a bunch of EC2 servers, all of that will be done just by deploying WebSocket APIs. Now, behind the scenes, you can still invoke any of those backends that you already invoked today. So um, Lambda, EC2, you know, anything that's HTTP, or any other AWS service. So just keep in mind that when, you, when your clients connect to API Gateway, that's a stateful WebSocket connection that will remain open. And then the backends will be a stateless connection where we invoke whatever configured backend that you have. So um, one of the primary drivers that we wanted to do in the serverless world is to remove all of that undifferentiated code that you have to write as a developer. We, have to, we want to make it easy for you to work on the things that are unique for your business. So the number one thing that we did, um, we recently allowed uh, you as an app developer to target Lambda from an ALB. So an ALB is an application load balancer. You can always target EC2 instances and container-based tasks, but now you can target Lambda. So what that means is you can have a fleet of compute resources behind the scenes and mix and match the services that make the most sense. So for example, if you have an ALB, you know, .amazon.com slash some path, and you want that path to be running using Lambda, you can do that. Or if you want a different path to be executed and, and served by EC2 resources, you can do that as well. So very easy to do. Um, all you have to do is configure your routing rules, and then we'll route based on host, based on path, based on uh, any HTTP or query parameter that comes in. So um, now, the next thing that we did was we got a lot of feedback from customers that when you're building those Lambda functions, you have to include all of those dependencies that your function needs. So if you have a function that's doing uh, WebSocket connections in Node, you're going to have to package the WebSocket APIs and then push that entire zip file up to, uh, up to, up to Lambda. So let's say you're, you're a very large enterprise and you share a common code base across multiple Lambda functions. So you used to have to publish the same dependencies over and over. And uh, we got a lot of feedback that this was, this was, number one, difficult for app developers to share a common code base. Number two is making your Lambda deployment packages larger in size. So now you can take advantage of a new feature called Lambda Layers. So you can publish your dependencies to a layer, and then at configuration time, you can say, my Lambda function needs this layer. So it needs the WebSocket layer. So I can, I can use, for example, Node and NPM install all of my dependencies I need in a layer, and then at config time for my function, add that as a layer. And you can have up to five layers for any function. So it allows app developers to maintain that easy code base and then easily push that across thousands of functions that, that share that same code base. So um, 
One of the things that this allowed us to do was create custom runtimes. So we looked at the seven programming languages that we support today. If you have a programming language that isn't supported, or if you have a, a version of those languages, you can use a layer and actually just publish your own programming language. So uh, I, have a I have some customers who actually are deploying COBOL in Lambda. So um, maybe not the most performant, uh, but however, it is possible by using a layer and adding, adding it as a runtime. So um, I wanted to give you a demo of a service called uh, SAM. So has anybody heard of SAM, the serverless application model? Cool. So maybe like, a, like a five or 10 people. So because you're working in Lambda and everything runs on AWS, developers find it difficult to test locally and to run functions locally and debug locally. So uh, how do you test Lambda functions? Do you, you just console out, right? You write a bunch of logs, and then you view the logs, and that's how you test it. That's not really a good developer experience, in my opinion, right? So with, with Sam, you can now run Lambda functions completely locally on your laptops. And the way it works is you'll install Docker on your machine, and then you'll pull down, Sam will pull down the, uh, the, the Lambda image that we actually publish and release to everyone. So you can actually go and download that Lambda image to see what's in the runtime. But we publish that Lambda image, we run it locally on your machine, and then we allow you to invoke Lambda functions just like they're invoked on AWS. So at that project is called SAM CLI or SAM Local. So let me uh, switch over to Visual Studio Code here. And um, Visual Studio Code is one of the, my favorite IDEs just because it's super lightweight and it's really easy to use, has a lot of cool plugins. There's an AWS plugin here as well that allows you to connect to all of your AWS resources. So if you're familiar with Lambda, this should look fairly simple to you or fairly familiar. Um, I have a Node.js application, and this application is very simple. All it's going to do is do some logging on line 5. Make this a little bigger. OK. So, um, Line five is going to do a little bit of logging. And then all it's doing is I have a static list of contacts, George, Jim, Laura, and Alice. And then all I'm doing is returning that entire list as a JSON response. right? So uh, line 19 creates my HTTP response just to 200 OK. And then I send it as a return uh, as my last line here. I have a couple breakpoints set up because uh, as an app developer, if I need to debug my applications, you know, typically you use breakpoints. And that really isn't possible if you're working directly in uh, the Lambda environment. So if you're working with SAM, you need to have a SAM template. So a SAM templates are YAML files. And SAM templates define my application. So in this case, I'm defining a function called getContacts. So this function is a type serverless function, line 8. So Sam also supports many other serverless resources, Dynamo, API Gateway, other things. In this case, I'm just using a serverless function. There's a couple properties I have to configure. So I'm saying uh, my handler method, remember, is the entry point for my app. So my handler method is a file called contacts, fn. And the function I want to begin with is called handler. So I have a file called contacts, fn. And then I have a handler method right here. So then I'm specifying the runtime as Node.js 6.10. I could have set Node.js uh, 8 or even 4.3, but that's pretty much deprecated at this point. Um, and I'm saying this function can only run for three seconds. So if my compute code in my function runs longer than three seconds, it'll time out, and I'll get a timeout exception. Now, the cool part about this is I'm actually configuring a REST endpoint, so an API that's going to hook up to the Lambda function and allow me to invoke this function. So it's just like standing up a microservice hosted on an HTTP server and then invoking your Lambda function. So in order to run this, I, need, I simply need to do SAM uh, local start API. So LAM local start API will read through this template and then boot up my local environment and run my, my service function. So when I do that, I get a little bit of output that says, OK, I'm hosting uh, a couple endpoints, one on contacts, one on contacts-swagger. 
And if you're familiar with APIs, Swagger is a way to define uh, and document APIs so you can import and export them easily. I'm actually just hosting two endpoints just because one's based on Swagger, one's based on declarative implementation here. So if I run this um, here, locally, 127, 0, 0, 0, I'm using port 3000. Uh, this has invoked my Lambda function through an HTTP request and then returned the, the JSON results. So if I look back here on my, on my output, um, we can see that this is running on HTTP port 3000 and then go over here. I just have a plugin installed that's reading JSON and making a pretty print. But uh, if I do raw data here, I can see that it's just the same JSON data that I implemented. Now, what's really cool about SAM is that you can make live changes in real time and have them automatically deploy in real time. So one of the things I hate the most as an app developer is having to shut down my system, recompile, deploy, and reboot. Like That process is, is short, but if you're doing it 100 times a day, it's, you know, it's, it's just a waste of time, right? So let's say I wanted to add another contact, and um, I want that contact to be another name called micro exchange, right? Type it in, hit save, go back to my IDE or my browser and hit refresh. So at this point, it'll auto compile in real time, and then it should bring down the, uh, the updated code. So line number four, or array record number four, is uh, micro exchange. So um, now I just hit Control C here to, to quit this guy here. Uh, okay. Go back up. So I'm going to open another terminal, and. So now what if I didn't want to run an API and I just wanted to invoke my Lambda function? Maybe this function isn't a REST-based microservice. So I can also do that by doing SAM local, invoke the name of my function. So can everybody see in the back? SAM local, invoke the name of my function, and that function is called get contacts. And remember, on line seven here, I've defined that as get contacts. I can name this anything I want. I could have called it A, B, C, D if I wanted to. But I'm invoking get contacts with a, sim with a sample parameter called uh, a form of file called event.json. And this is going to be that first parameter that we saw in the, Lambda, uh, in the Lambda anatomy. This is why my function was invoked. Right? So I'm going to get rid of this option here for now, but I'll run this. And you can see immediately that it's running locally and it's invoking my contact handler. Uh, and then, so everything in, in, in the colors, green and blue, is the output from my Lambda service. So this is the exact same output that you would see when you're running it on uh, AWS. Now the, the, the key lines to look at are going to be the ones in green. So the first line is a start line. The start line indicates where your Lambda function began execution, right? Really basic. But the most important piece is that request ID. Every single invoke of Lambda gets assigned a unique ID. So what that means is you can use that to track what's happening in your function. And if you have an issue with your application, you can use it to talk to support. And support can help you trace exactly what's going on. Everything in between the start and the end line is where your function began and ended. So everything in blue is output from my code. So my code simply said uh, start and end, right? So nothing, nothing super complex. Now, the, the cool piece of this is the report line, the very last green line here. So there's a couple pieces from the report line. It's telling me my function ran for 19.87 milliseconds. And it's telling me I was billed for 100 milliseconds. Does anybody know why? So Lambda functions are billed at 100 millisecond intervals. So if you ran for 101 milliseconds, you'll be billed for 200. Um, so now it's also telling me another setting down here, memory size 128 megs. So by default, Lambda functions using Node.js start with 128 megs. I can change that in my Lambda configuration if I want to. Um, I didn't specify it here, but if I wanted to, I could say memory anything up to three gigs. And it's also telling me I only use 26 megabytes. So if I run this over and over and over, I can quickly tell that my, my service probably doesn't need that much memory. 
And in this case, I can't go any smaller because 128 megs is the smallest. But if I had it set at three gigs, it's probably telling me that I'm wasting a lot of, of memory. So, um, and then the very bottom is just, just the output, you know, the, the output from my array, right? It just returns that data. So now let's pretend that I have a, I have a problem with uh, this Lambda function. And instead of doing a bunch of console.logs to, to figure out why, um, I just attach a dash D option, which stands for debug, and specifically remote debugging. So I'm using port 5858. You can configure any available port on your machines. And if I run this, it's going to attach a remote debugger. And I'm just going to wait until it tells me that. Cool. So it says debugger listening on 5858. So the next thing I have to do is slip over to my debug console here on the left. It's that little bug. Click on that guy. And then just attach that debugger to my function. So once I attach it to my function, it's a, it's a, this is a standard experience that you already are used to as app developers. It's just stepping through your code. You have local variables here. And you can add as many watch statements as you want on the left. And then the call stack is, is available for you to, to look at. So um, I can easily step over each line, right? And then I can inspect any variable. So it's undefined right now because I haven't executed line 9. But if I look at line 7, this has been executed. So I have an array with um, five items on it. And um, I can hit this, this Go button, and it will keep going to my next breakpoint. And this is going to be essentially the last piece of uh, execution in my, in my function. And then hit Run one more time, and it will finish that execution. So this will be exactly the same that we saw earlier. Um, the uh, execution duration is 48,000 milliseconds. Um, that's because we, you know, we manually stepped through that. But um, if I were to run this for a long time, it would eventually time out. Right? So cool. So now that you have a pretty good understanding of how to, do, how to build Lambda functions, um, I definitely recommend looking at SAM, and then when you're building those functions, starting locally before you publish to uh, AWS. So SAM has a couple commands that, that when you're ready, it'll automatically package and then deploy your application out to AWS in just a couple lines of code. So those commands are going to be um, SAM package. So if I were to do SAM package here, and SAM package zips up your entire app directory. If you were doing Java, you'd have to do a compile step before that. Um, and then it's going to publish it as three. So in S3, I, have, I now have a zipped binary that I can deploy to my Lambda functions right? using this, this next command down here. So SAM deploy. All right, so um, back to my deck here. Okay. Has anyone heard of GraphQL? Not GraphDB, but GraphQL. Cool. So GraphQL was actually, um, it's a query language invented by Facebook. And whenever you go on Facebook.com, you're probably using GraphQL. And GraphQL is a language that is, it's not REST-based. So it's, it's a language that uh, kind of helps to solve some of the issues that uh, REST developers uh, run into all the time. So AWS has a service called AppSync. And AppSync is a managed GraphQL implementation. And what it does is it has a bunch of other capabilities on top of GraphQL. So you can do real-time web sockets with GraphQL. So let's say you have a dashboard and you have updated information coming in really quickly. You don't really want to issue hundreds and thousands of REST calls every second. Right, that would, at scale, that would essentially break your, your application. Um, you just want to have an open web socket connection that has two-way communication between you and the, the app server. Um, one of the coolest things is that you can do offline syncing. So if you're at a conference like this, you have no Wi-Fi, you update some information, as soon as you get Wi-Fi, it'll sync your, your information back out to um, the GraphQL service. So behind the scenes, uh, we can query any one of these uh, services, so DynamoDB, any HTTP data source, a Lambda function, um, Elasticsearch, and very recently we added the ability to, to run a SQL query against a, a, a database server. So the idea is, um, let's say you have that contacts API that we were just looking at. 
in order to get different types of information about my contacts, on the left here are all of the REST endpoints that I have to set up. If I want to get all contacts, I can do slash contacts. If I just want to get, let's say, all contacts by a state, there's no way to do that with REST. Like, I have to create another resource that does that. And everything that gets returned from that implementation is static. Right? So you can't say, as a, as a consumer of my API, you can't say, I only want the name of my contact. Right? I, have, I would get everything my REST implementation defines. So you know, if you want by company, or you want every contact that starts with some kind of name, those all have to be new implementations. So if you have a lot of these, it gets difficult. You could try to sort of add parameters and query parameters, path parameters to, to change this. But at the end of the day, you have to do some sort of static configuration, and REST always returns a static set of, of uh, data. So um, REST-based fetching is, is, uh, is suitable for most applications, but what if you just wanted to hit one endpoint and then have that endpoint respond to what you want? So GraphQL can do that for you, where you as a GraphQL query uh, client can specify just the resources that you want, and behind the scenes, we can resolve those attributes of your data sets to multiple different data sources. So let's take a look at kind of how that works. So in this example, this is a GraphQL query where um, I want to get a contact, specifically a contact with ID 111. And in this example, I want the name, email, and the location of my contact. So in order to do that, name and email are stored in DynamoDB because those are static attributes. Like those don't but those don't really change that often. And if they do change, I can update them. Um, location is going to be a dynamic setting. It's going to be tracking the location of my contact. And you wouldn't want to put that in Dynamo, because uh, you want to be able to, at real time, get that contact's location. So when I ask for these three sets of information, AppSync will hit two data sources and then resolve all of that information before bringing it back out to the, whoever called my API. So my API, or my client that's calling this, creating this query, doesn't know what's behind the scenes. It doesn't care. Like, I just want the, these three attributes for my API, or for my contact, and then it returns all information. So here's another example. What if I just wanted my contact name? Right? I don't want any of that other information. So in this case, I just specify name in my query. And in this step, the only resolver that gets executed is the DynamoDB resolver. So my Lambda function is never executed. So this makes it really powerful as a query consumer where I can configure and specify just the data that I want. And what this results in is, is less wasted data overhead, right? Because if I wanted name and I get all the information back, I'm just going to throw it away. I'm not going to use it, right? And I'm also probably adding um, latency, because I don't want to execute my Lambda function to get location. I just want to execute a DynamoDB query to get the name. So um, let's take a look at how AppSync works. So I'm going to bring up my DynamoDB console, oh, sorry, my AppSync console, and I've predefined a contact type. Can everybody see? And my contact type just contains those attributes we looked at. Email, first name, last name, location. Um, notice a type doesn't define where it's going to be resolved from. Like That's configuration on AppSync. And then I have a bunch of mutations. So mutations are just like when you want to modify data, you would send a mutation. Um, and a bunch of queries. So let's say I want to get some contacts. I'll go over to the Queries tab right here. So I already have the tab open. And I want to run this query. Get all contacts. So when I run this query, I currently have location commented out, because I don't care about location. I just want to execute and tell me the email, first name, and last name. So on the right here, we can see the response. We have one, two, three, four, five contacts. And this just gave me email, first name, and last name. If I was building a social media app and I actually cared about location, I would put location back into the query and then run that. And when I submit this query, behind the scenes, AppSync will invoke my Lambda function that's doing this work and then get the location of my user. So now, in my response, I have a new, I have a new property called location. And the location is just 
you know, the, the area that I'm in. So George is in DC, James is in Rome, Clark Kent is also in DC, and uh, this test account is in Las Vegas. So behind the scenes, my Lambda function is simply doing a randomization. It's grabbing that, that array of locations and just randomizing the response. So if I run this again, um, you know, stuff might be different. George is now in Rome. So um, if I wanted to get like a specific contact here, right, I can do that as well. So I can do query, get contact, and run that. And this just gives me one specific contact. So um, behind the scenes, here's a look at my DynamoDB table. So my table currently lives, the, query, the table that I'm querying lives in a region, US West 2. So it's on the west coast of, of uh, the United States, and a whole, a whole bunch of records in here. Now, um, most companies are concerned with disaster recovery, making sure your data isn't in one place. And typically, you have to either maintain your DR yourself using software or buy another piece of software that does it for you. But with Dynamo, you can enable what we call global tables. So when you enable global tables, this tab right here, we automatically replicate your data from one region to another whenever any mutation occurs. So you don't have to do anything to make your data available globally. So I've actually gone into the Frankfurt region here, created another table. It's the same table, test contacts table. And this data is automatically replicated um, from any insert that I get on my primary table living in US West 2. So now keep in mind, these, are, these tables are multi-master, which means that if I have application users and, I, and they connect to my Frankfurt deployment of this app, it will automatically spread all the writes from my, my Frankfurt table to my other tables. So behind the scenes, whatever tables get the writes last will win. So that's kind of how global tables work. And you can have as many deployments and, as you want globally around the world. It doesn't have to be two tables. Right? You could have a, a huge deployment model on every continent. So if I were to manually insert a record here, it would show up on my, uh, on my other table within probably generally within just a couple seconds. OK, so um, last thing is, uh, has anybody ever heard of Alexa? You know, Alexa, tell me about the weather, or tell me about my com commute to work. So behind the scenes, when you, when you ask Alexa for information, it's actually executing Lambda functions. Those skills are running compute on Lambda to respond to your query, right? So as an app developer, you can go to the app portal and implement your own Alexa skill that says, Alexa, scare my wife when, I, when she wakes up in the morning. So um, it, all it's doing is transcribing your voice, sending that JSON text data payload to a Lambda function, and your function is responsible for parsing that, that text and then doing whatever compute needs to be done and returning the results out. So um, pretty easy to implement. I definitely encourage you to, to try it out. So just a couple summaries. Um, Let's take a look at just uh, what we have to do in the server full world in order to implement applications. We start with network, right? After network, we've got host and VM configuration. After, after that, you've got uh, scaling and load balancing. So you have to be able to have load balancers that, that, that distribute requests. And then after that, you're finally up to the OS level where you're configuring patches, you know, installing Linux or whatever OS you've chosen. And then we're finally ready to run our uh, whatever service is going to serve our application up. Next to that, we're going to run and deploy our app code. So you have like one, two, three, four, five, six steps you have to do in the serverless, in the server full world. In Lambda, in the serverless world, you just start with code. Like we saw it, all you do is jump into there, write your code, deploy it, and it runs uh, on your behalf. And you can run nearly whatever concurrency that you like. And uh, all you have to do is work with AWS, and we'll help you, you know, architect and coordinate your server list application. So that's all I have. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, all of my contact information is here. Definitely encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I have a bunch of stickers up here as well. So if you're interested in a sticker, you know, come up here and see me. And thank you for coming.
think, so we have time for questions. So do you have some questions? Here in the front row, first one. So, I'm sorry, we have, to, we have to get the microphone, I'm sorry. Hi, so how you deal with the cold starts in Lambdas? How do we deal with cold starts? Yeah. So there's a, there's a term called a cold start in the serverless world. Um, it's essentially a phenomenon that exists when you have no code executing, and there's a little bit of a trade-off you have to make. When you first execute your Lambda function after a long period of inactivity, we have to provision a container, drop your code on it, and then run it. So equate that to essentially doing a Spring Boot launch, um, and that launch is, you know, time, is a little bit time intensive. We have to do all those, those heavy lifts, right? Um, there's a lot of sort of performance tweaks you can do in your code um, to reuse uh, state. Also, um, you can pre-warm your functions by hitting your functions every uh, five minutes to keep them warm and active to whatever concurrency that, that you need. Um, there's a lot of sample code out there on GitHub. Um, I have some sample code on my GitHub page as well that you can look at to, to kind of show you how to do that. Um, there's also a CloudWatch event, scheduled events, so you can run that automatically trigger Lambda functions. Uh, generally, what I would say is that if you're in a production environment, you're going to see traffic to your applications on a fairly steady basis, and cold starts really aren't too much of an issue. It's generally in like QA and tests when, you, when your people you know, have these spikes and, and dips in, in workload. You know, people go home at the end of the night and everything shuts down, right? So um, we can help you with optimization of code or any, any best practices. We just released a couple of white papers, actually, that you should you know, read through that can, that can help you with that. Do we have another question? So there. Thanks. Um, are there any new, exciting new features coming from AWS to help serverless development? that you can tell us about? Um, so, good question. Uh, did, you, did anybody go to reInvent 2018 back in November? One, two? Okay, so we actually announced a bunch of stuff at reInvent. If you didn't make it there, all of our videos are available online on YouTube, so, so hit the YouTube sites, um, our channels, and, and you can review all those. Um, one of the things that was announced was a firecracker. So anybody, anybody heard of Firecracker or the open source implementation? So behind the scenes, obviously Lambda functions are serverless to, to me as a consumer of them, but they're not serverless because that would be magic. Um, but so we're changing the way we operate our Lambda functions using the, the Firecracker model, which is uh, essentially micro VMs running on each host. So you have micro VMs on a VM for each host and security isolation across micro VMs. So what that's gonna do is improve cold start and also make security a lot better. Uh, definitely check out the GitHub repository if you're interested in the, how it was implemented. Um, I encourage you to look at it, but you, there's probably no reason to, to try to run your own micro, uh, Firecracker deployment. Um, but it's all there, you can look at the code and, and read on kind of how it works. So there's another question on the left side. Thanks a lot for the talk. I have a question on versioning of lambdas. Um, is there any concept of like I can have versioning or blue, blue green deployment, things yeah. like this? So how do you version control lambda functions? So it's a good question. Every lambda function has, has a feature called versioning and aliases. So when you publish a lambda function, you get a long string, which is an ARN, an Amazon resource name, and that string is a unique identifier to a, to a lambda function. Now if you turn on versioning, um, we append a version number to that string. So you have lambda ARN colon version one. And then as you publish new versions, you'll get version two, three, four, five. Um, you can use the concept of an alias, which is just a pointer. So you create an alias that points to any version. And aliases have the ability to do weighted aliases. So you can say, I want this alias to point to two versions at specific percentages. So I would send certain percentages of my traffic to version one, and certain percentage to version three, right? Um, when you're publishing production-ready applications, you would keep incrementing your version, and then when you say version 10 is ready, you would take your alias and point it at the new uh, Lambda function. So one of the cool ways that, that you can automate that is using AWS Code Deploy, and they can manage that pretty much automated on your behalf. Yeah. Thanks. 
Okay, so we are end of time. So thanks again. Give him, give George a warm hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you.